What is up, Generals? We are back with Ultimate General Civil War. We are working on our Major General Confederate Let's Play, and we are working towards the battle. Uh, well, I hesitate to call it a battle, but I, I'd say the skirmish of Supply Run. Um, in this episode, I'd like to send a shout out to uh, Reddit user After One. He made um, some excellent commentary uh, that... I should do a little more camp content and I should talk a little bit more about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and it, it that's a personal failing because uh, the development and construction of my Union Army was such a central theme to the Union campaign that uh, it was, to me, almost automatic. And uh, it's quite likely that there are some users or viewers that didn't or haven't watched the Union campaign or haven't watched that series as the army developed. Uh, so before we jump into Supply Raid, um, the first thing I'll say is I've uh, already tried to record, well, I've played a test version of Supply Raid, so I have a secondary, I have a secondary save uh, called Test where basically I play um, the next battle so I'm not caught too terribly by surprise and of course I wasn't recording and of course that went <laughs> super smoothly so um you know Murphy's Law this particular version of the battle will go nothing like that um but anywho let's take a quick look at where the Confederate command of Rebel Fiasco's I Corps uh currently stands and why I've made the decisions I've made um with regard to army composition. So the Confederate Infantry Brigade at this current moment in time stands at 1000 soldiers. Um by the comparable time in the Union Let's Play my infantry brigades were at the 850 or 900 man size and that was because I was being asked to scale up far larger, far quicker. Uh the um, ability of the Union or the, the Confederate Army to keep its initial core uh, fairly small leading up to Shiloh. Now, I do need to expand um, to Shiloh. So we currently have Army Org 4, and before Shiloh, we need to get to uh, Army Org 6, and that's because we need to be able to field... Give me a second here. We need to be able to field 20 um, brigades to fully utilize our army. We can get away with 15. I would rather not because um, at the moment we are, I mean, severely outnumbered. And that, you know, scaling is part of that. And the fact that you get allied soldiers in in part of that as well is, is some of the issue. But we, this force would significantly lack the uh, staying power to push some of these engagements through. So, the next two engagements, let's take a look at uh, Stay Alert and Ambush Convoy. Uh, they they both utilize uh, 10, uh, I believe, 10, 10 brigades uh, as the size. Yeah, so they both utilize 10 as the size. And so, um, I've pushed from Bull Run to this composition, and this is um, your basic kind of combined arms force uh, and you're looking at now sort of the the prototypical model of what um, a fiasco core will ultimately look like so one of the nice things about the confederate army is you start out with really great recruits and if i had a colonel or colonels to spare i might be able to push these units to one star almost immediately uh, but 1,000 men, because I'm able to keep the army relatively small and I'll be able to, to expand um, rapidly to include the remainder of the other 20 brigades will be the fighting size of a brigade. Uh, additionally, every unit that exists in the army at the moment is utilizing a rifled weapon, and that is significant because I really don't like smoothbores. Um, I really don't like the smoothbore weapons. Even the 1841 Mississippi, which is a relatively inaccurate rifled weapon, has an accuracy low of 40. When you take a look and compare against the even the Palmetto, uh, the accuracy low is 13.5. What this tells us is that in order to get the best use out of these weapons, which is to say both of these, and, and, and to a lesser degree the farmers, although thankfully we don't need to buy them, um, you really need to be right on top of the units that you are trying to shoot. And that's fine. And and there is a place for that kind of a unit in the army that we'll call it a grenadier, or we'll, we'll call it a... Uh, um, a shock trooper where, where they really want to get in the face 
uh, of the opponent and pour fire at very, very close range. There's a place for that in the army. Um, but at the moment, there's a far better place in the army for um, rifled weapons. The comparison from the, the 12.5 accuracy low, take a look at the Lorenz. 75 is the accuracy low. So this weapon, this rifle is damn near as good as it is at long range, at, at the 300 yard effective long range as it is up close. And it does obviously get better up close, but every weapon has an accuracy high of 110 at very close ranges in terms of the rifled um, weapons. And the MJ is a very slightly better um, version of the Model 1841 uh, Mississippi. So right now we're looking at all of these rifles have a fire rate of 39. All of these rifles have a damage that's uh, uh, around 13, give or take. Um, and their accuracy low is still pretty good. Uh, there is a significant difference, however, between the 1841 accuracy low of 40 and the Lorenz accuracy low of 75. When we get to the point where we can start filling them in large number, the Enfield will likely make up the bulk of my army as it's what we're going to have access to in large number. Additionally, we are likely to capture from the Union a large number of um, the Springfield line of weapons. So I would imagine um, 55s, Harper's Ferries, and 61s as the war progresses. However, um, you can't rely on that because you need to... What the Union soldier carries is dependent upon their armory stat. And depending on how heavily you inflict casualties, this level here will rise or lower, raise or... Um, Fat raise it will always raise, but it will raise at faster or slower rates. Uh, in my Union campaign, for example, um, in the Union campaign, we're just before the Battle of Cold Mountain, and the Confederacy has been kept somewhere in the vicinity of a fifty percent armory rating, um, and so they're still using eighteen forty ones, and they're still using a handful, a smattering of CS Richmonds, and a lot of Tyler Texases. As a comparison. At the exact same point in his campaign, something Compass's Union campaign sees a slightly higher armory value, and the Confederacy is predominantly armed with C.S. Richmonds and a handful of Fayettevilles. So the armory stat dictates to a large degree, the enemy's armory stat dictates to a large degree what you capture, also in rifles, but also in artillery. So... Um, I was, for a while there, seeing a lot of 10-pound parrots, uh, and and maybe some 24 pound howitzers in the Confederate army in my union campaign just before cold mountain. And because I've so effectively hammered their, um, army on the casualty front, I'm now seeing them using again, 12 pound howitzers and Napoleons, which is a downgrade in tier as a weapon. So you can't rely on the armory stat like you can the reputation vendor. So keep that in mind. Additionally, I've been hyper, I've been aggressively spending reputation to pick up. Um, there were, uh, I believe, 41s or the Lorenzes and the MJs I picked up as, I think, rep rewards. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Additionally, we've added an artillery component to the army. The small... Um, battery of Tredegars in our experienced unit and a uh, medium sized battery of 24 pound howitzers in second artillery. This is a green unit under a light colonel, but it is very likely to level up in the course of this battle if we're not bad about how we utilize it. Additionally, to continue the combined arms theme, I have one shock cavalry unit um, and one uh, sharpshooter unit using the non-scoped variant of the Whitworth. The Whitworth is roughly comparable to the Sharp on the Union side and is a, um, is a non-scoped, long-range, accurate rifled weapon. So effective range, notice the stat here. Uh, the damage is lower than the, a battle rifle, but the effective range is 200 yards further, and the accuracy low is fairly high at 85. Uh, the fire rate is comparable to the infantry rifles at 43. Let's just compare that again to the 41 uh, fire rate being 39 and the Lorenz fire rate being, I think, 40. Yeah, so the Whitworth has a fairly comparable fire rate, significantly longer range, uh, and actually not that much higher of an accuracy uh, to the Lorenz, which is further underscores why I like the Lorenz so much. 
Um, let's take a look at the piece de resistance, uh, the scoped width worth. So the scoped width worth extends your range out a further 100 yards and gives you just a significant jump in accuracy to, um, I mean, you're, you're you're going between 90 and 110. Basically, you're just going to always hit. It's it's really fantastic. The scope Whitworth is a hell of a gun. And actually, once we've got the money, let's go ahead and buy the 64. So the reason I'm doing that is clearly I don't have a unit that I can field at 83 soldiers. But the armory and the barracks um, deplete after every major battle. And that means that... Uh, what's here if i play the battle of shiloh and then and then go to the continue the campaign on what's here will be gone forever lost to the ether so excuse me again so i tend to buy everything below um uh, majors and below for sure but like the major band i'll buy and usually also the light colonel i'll buy i don't feel as if generals or full full, full bird uh, or I guess three-star colonels, um, are typically worth the money. They get pretty expensive. Um, although in the Confederate campaign, cash is often not your uh, your limiting factor. Rather, it's manpower. And then after a certain juncture, it's actually having weapons to give those men. And take a point, case in point, when I expand the army to um, uh, to handle the Battle of Shiloh, I'll have, if I throw the cash at it, one brigade using Enfields, two more brigades using Lorenzo's, assuming I, keep, assuming I keep my casualties fairly low, and the remainder of the army will probably be using either older Mississippis or smoothbore weapons. And we'll see. I'd like, I'd like, and this is a like to have, I'd like to have the entirety of my army or my command using smooth or rifled weapons going into Shiloh, but that is a, you know, a pipe dream. Um likely we will expand our artillery arm to include um these three inch ordnance or 10 pound ordnance as we already have them uh, i'll expand the battery out to eight guns i think um and i may pick up this parrot for later because the 20 pound parrot is um the premier range gun in this game and the confederates have very limit you know what yeah, the Confederates have very limited access to these top tier cannon, the 14 pound James, 24 pound howitzer, and the 20 pound Parrot. You you really pretty much have to rely on capturing them to um, to get the most out of them. Anywho, so that without further ado, um, I think let's probably beef this unit up a little larger. Because I expect you to get into the, the thick of it. All right. Um, so once again, generally speaking, when it comes to exp uh, expanding uh, battle-wounded brigades, I tend to try and use rookies as often as possible. And in this campaign, until I get to the point where I'm fielding large numbers of two-star units, I'm probably going to use rookies exclusively. Confederate recruits are that good. Um when you're building your army, especially in this early phase of the campaign where you're just aggressively exploding out your core, it is you cannot afford to be wasting money on veterans. Side note, there are a lot of different schools of thought on that particular issue, and I encourage you to go watch other YouTubers, Something Compass, uh, a, a YouTuber named Spectrum, and a YouTuber named Panda Kraut. Um uh, and also a YouTuber named Aetius Flavius, uh, A-E-T-I-U-S, Flavius more or less as it sounds. Um, and uh, especially Pandacraut and Aetius have both, to my knowledge, done relatively recent Confederate campaigns. And they have very different play styles from me, so don't take this as gospel. This is the way that I like to play the game. I like big armies. I like uh, combined arms. I like melee cavalry um and that kind of thing so and, and i'm not i myself am not good at micro so i tend to have very few skirmishers um or, or light infantry because uh i'm shit at micro i'm gonna be a flat out honest with you i'm bad at it and i often don't think that a lot of these guys are really worth it so i'll have one or two at most in in my entire all three all of my core i'll have one or two units at most 
Um, and then I'll probably have a brute squad of cavalry because I found that cavalry is really effective in multiples. So one unit of cav tends to get bogged down. Two units of cav can really, really fuck some shit up. Uh, and that's where I think that their two or three uh, units of cav can really be fantastic. Uh, if you have watched my uh, Union Let's Play um, second bull run, I really effectively utilized cavalry in collapsing a flank. Um, and I was really pleasantly surprised with the utilization of cavalry in uh, Chancellorsville at the Union campaign. And that really kind of solidified my personal methodology with regard to cavalry. Um and then the last bit before I jump into the battle here, and I, I do apologize, this is kind of a long video um, and we haven't done any action yet, is when it comes to my methodology with vis-a-vis -vis officers, I much prefer um, the homegrown variant or the homegrown style of developing your officer core. I love taking cheap majors and turning them into generals. I love taking these, you know, growing internally um, my my commanders, Tom Jackson, Thomas Jackson here will eventually be a core commander. And then fiasco will, will probably keep I core. And then Thomas Jackson will take over second core and that kind of thing. Um, or if I get Joe Johnston or, you know, I think at some juncture we get general Lee. I don't really remember. It's been a minute since I played the Confederate campaign, but generally speaking, I have a strong, strong, strong preference of growing my officers internal to the core. It's a cost thing, cheaper, lower level officers are cheaper. I mean, this is 300, $194. It's nothing. 700, 800, 900, whatever. It's just cheap, 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 cheap. You buy these generals. They're, I mean, they're good. They're, they're leveled up. They're ready to go, but it's also six grand. That's a non-zero amount of my cash. That's 10% of my current armory. Um, and I, I just, you know, I can't justify it. So, uh, let's go ahead and jump into, um, the campaign before Shiloh. And I tend to do these in chronological order. Um, so let's do Ambush convoy. The Union is massing near the capital, uh, Richmond. Certainly they are preparing to attack, blah, 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 blah. Let's go steal some stuff. I love this mission. I think it's so, like, perfect for um, the Confederacy, where the the narrative, accurate or otherwise, um, is is that the Confederacy needed to kind of bogart a lot of Union supplies and, and utilize captured Union equipment because they lacked the arms manufacturer, the arms industry, to support... Um, a homegrown, you know, artillery, a homegrown, all this kind of stuff. I, I love this mission because it fits that narrative uh, just perfectly. It's a lot of fun too, because um, you get to just be that kind of dashing uh, cavalry commander. Union are doing some crap, whatever. There's a the thing they kind of tell you about what's coming up. So the the long story short is there's a couple of supply wagons coming from Mia. Actually, when the game when the mission starts, they're actually already here, and they're kind of moving down this road towards wherever it is the hell they're going, Richmond or something. This is presumably the lead up to the seven days battles, um, which I think is the next major series of missions. Uh, and then there's two infantry brigades guarding the supply wagons. Uh, and then pretty rapidly, you're going to get another division or so of union troops that appear here ish, presumably to su support those, uh, supply wagons and then once battle is joined so to speak uh, another division or so of troops will appear here-ish uh, and I believe that's one artillery one cavalry and like two or three um, infantry we'll see I don't know generally speaking the way that I like to handle this mission is um, the, so the one way you can play it is you bum rush the middle here get your three supply wagons and then pull everything back and just hide in fort fuck off over here and uh you know you just bunker up with your cannons and your infantry and the union might probably try and charge you and then that's it the issue with that thought process and it's it's not an invalid one is is because it, it keeps your losses to a minimum the issue with that thought process is it's not inflicting losses on the union uh, and you need to be aggressively hunting down and destroying as many Union units as possible, inflict heavy casualties at every possible opportunity in this campaign, especially as the Confederate player. You have to do it as a Union player too, of course, um, but Union access to high-level artillery, Union access to just an endless supply of recruits, and Union access to decent rifles from just their regular store means it's not quite as bad, and you can bounce back from that with smart play. Um, I did it uh, in my Union campaign. I had been 
a little lackadaisical about some things uh, up until Chancellorsville, and it resulted in me fighting a Confederate army with uh, 3,000 man brigades and just getting my shit pushed in. So um, it was a fun battle, and it worked out in my favor, and actually uh, we got a complete... A nearly complete destruction of the con- of the Confederate army in that battle, and and as a result, the Union campaign has continued to be relatively easy thereafter, and that's just kind of pushed home for me the uh, guidance of you need to be very aggressively keeping their numbers down. You have to like call their numbers, um, or shit will get out of control really damn quick. PDQ. So um, what that means is that we're going to try and inflict the most possible damage in addition to also getting the wagons. What's frustrating for me is in my test game, that worked out perfectly. We were able to engage up here, crush or push everything in this direction, pocket it in the corner and destroy it, and then form kind of a little U shape here, and then march out and engage uh, their army. You know, the timer ran out, we didn't kill everything. Okay, fine, whatever. But we knocked out, I think, two or three brigades, destroyed their cavalry unit, destroyed their artillery unit, and then inflicted serious casualties on all of the units that were present. So the kill ratio was great. And we took 800 casualties and all that kind of stuff. It was fantastic. So inevitably, now that I'm recording, it's going to go terribly. Um, (laughs) So I should have more faith in myself. Um, What we're going to want to do is... Uh, you want to utilize the fact that you've got some open terrain over here for some of the units that you either need to move quickly, like your cavalry, who I'm going to be referring to as naming convention. Let's do this really quick too. Uh, Infantry is just going to be infantry. I debated for a long time, like no stars is militia, one stars is regulars, and two stars is elites or something like that, and it's just not worth it. Um, I occasionally promote individual units to guard status if I feel like an individual unit has performed well in a battle and is worth or noteworthy of remembrance. Um, so I have, you know, the Shiloh Rock and, and Brigade and that kind of thing for my union. So it's just kind of a little way for me to role play and remember the the journey of your army, which I think is at least two thirds of what makes this game so much more magical than some of the other excellent games out there that handle the Civil War, like Scourge of War, where you're just dropped in on somebody else's army. Um, I keep not being sure what I want to call skirmishers, and I keep, in in the Union campaign, they have a separate numerology, so there's one, two, three infantry, so forth and so on, and then one rifles, one artillery, one hussars, so forth and so on, um, or one, I think they're called light infantry in the Union play. Well, here I'm keeping them as the same numerology, so one, two, three, uh, there's four, there's five, there's six, this is seventh. It's just another infantry unit. It's just, it's a light infantry unit, so they're the rifles because they have, you know, rifles now that distinction kind of falls flat because everything has rifles but this is i'm predominantly a napoleonics fan so obviously you can tell the rifles are the skirmishers and blah 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 blah. I, i'm a fan of like sharps the sharps books and that kind of thing um melee cavalry will be referred to as hussars um because i intend to use them as shock cavalry and uh, the carbine cav like james over here i will refer to them as dragoons now when you're playing and you see the union cavalry you can tell which one's which because the dragoon type cav have a little carbine that comes across the horse head um, and dragoons are intended to be mounted infantry essentially they ride to wherever they need to fight they dismount and they fight so the plan here is to essentially form up here in kind of an L shape to crush and destroy whatever I can and then force it to flee this way. Then I'll continue to press, press, press aggressively, aggressively, aggressively until I can destroy what's at whatever's over here and then turn to face the reinforcements that come in this way who almost invariably push to the middle of the map, which is perfect. So what that means is I need to use my new units, uh, 5th Infantry, 4th Infantry, along with 7th Rifles, to rush forward and engage the cavalry, or engage the infantry with the supply wagons, while 1, 2, 3, and 6 um, all get into position to engage here. And actually, instead of running through the woods, I'm going to have them use the roads to get into position. Now, the timing here is a bit tight, so we need to be running. Um, and actually, I'll have 6 run uh, in the open terrain and possibly support the the newbies. So you have the vets and you have the noobs and then you have uh, Rebel Fiasco himself kind of doing the thing. All right, let's jump into it. So you initially put your orders out there. It's important that the cavalry use the roads because even Cav with their fast movement speed will lose 
both movement speed and fatigue moving through the woods. Essentially, you want to avoid, if at all possible, moving through woodline whenever you possibly can. Now, in the case of Rebel Fiasco, he doesn't have a stat line, so it doesn't really matter. He can just go wherever. And same with um, Henry here, my supply man. However, artillery is particularly bad about this. They lose speed like you would not believe moving through the woods. So what we're going to do is we're going to have them go over here. Um, and actually, no, I'm going to do this a little differently. So... We want these units basically in cover. Um, it's a little wonky. Uh, but to use the roads as much as possible getting into position. So the uh, howitzer unit will be a bit further forward. The Tridegar is right behind them. Tridegars are an interesting gun um, that performs better at long range. Yeah, below average canister, but they're okay in shell. So I'm actually okay with the Tridegars being back uh, maybe a little further. Like right right here actually this would be great for the Tredegers because they're going to come in right around there and that should be good and I don't want them bunched up too much because there's collateral damage the next thing we need to do is split off some skirmishers the T key for me I think is what does that check to make sure what yours does and what we're going to do is they're already set to run anyway so they're going to mob up right here and all they're doing is they're trying to trigger the game's retreat logic so when a unit breaks or routes or whatever it takes a look at what direction it can go away from the enemy and um away from the enemy so if the skirmishers are here it will say oh this is the only direction away from the enemy and hopefully and i i, I have seen this go wrong a dozen times they'll um run that way then we'll go ahead and use our infantry first infantry will run there and usually i do not advocate running but the timing here is pretty tight uh third foot will come along here and then um the second will probably also run then uh wait no that's a little yeah right there okay so that's that's the first part of our movement is to capture or meet them as they come in and then the next part of our force movement is to come uh you just hang out there so we can see stuff but i need you coming forward i need you go into the wood line and i need you as well so i'm still moving these people into places where they're going to be okay to engage and i want to try and draw the union into an engagement. All right, let's unpause and see how this goes. Good Christ, we're half an hour into this thing. <laughs> and I'm just now pressing unpause. I'm sorry. All right, so we see the supply wagons. We see the defenders, perfect. So we have one brigade, two brigades, just like it always is. Um, I want to pull these guys away, and I want to basically, <clears throat> what tends to happen is, well, let's just see what tends to happen. There you go. Okay. Perfect. So what's happened is the supply wagons have kind of freaked out and moved in the direction away from the two infantry brigades. The two brigades are at least aware of my presence. And um, what's great is the, the rifles are currently not seen by the unit or the enemy. So we're shooting at them, but they can't see us in return and so i'm trying to shoot them to get them aware of me and then i want to come in basically in an angle where the infantry won't shoot at me and this is always the tricky part for my um my, in my experience so the tricky part is always not getting shot um to shit by their infantry all right come here shoot that And I want them to meet or engage with me. Um, now, which way are they facing? I believe the thicker, the way you can tell they're facing sometimes is, yeah, see how I'm facing this way? And the three rank column, the thicker column is in the front here. So I think they're facing the correct direction for me to get the outcome I want here. Um, but what we're trying to do 
is meet the troops here as they come in, and then I want my units to try and see if they can't pick off. Let's get Jones. Get these supply wagons. All right. Uh, I think I can probably play this. Yeah, perfect. All right, cool. So we'll advance to just shoot the shit out of Robinson here. And then 6th Infantry is also in a good place. All right, so what I like about what we got going on right now is we're, we're pretty much well posted for when the time comes. Robinson's charging in, but he's already severely depleted. The rifles are probably blocked. All right, so here's the problem with the AI's tracking logic. 5th Infantry wants to shoot Robinson in support of 4th. That's all great. That's fantastic. The issue is that Robinson's currently at the edge of 5th Infantry's um, angle of fire. I've seen this happen a million times where the AI pivots a bit to get itself back in the angle of fire, but they keep running. So what you need to do in this instance when you're playing, pause the game really quick, put the unit on run so it pivots quicker, and then hold the shift key and tell it where you want it to face. So in this instance, 5th uh, Infantry is angled here. We want them facing about here, give or take, so that by the time they're done reloading, they'll be able to just fire away on Robinson and his back, and this should probably um, at least morale shock, if not rout Robinson altogether. Additionally, Bernie is completely out of position. He can't do anything to help anybody. He's currently trying to pivot to shoot Davis, and I don't really care. Davis is an AI unit, so what does it matter? We've got 7th Rifles as well in a great position to support. And then the Skirmishers from 4th additionally can support their parent unit in combat if if Robinson does manage to make my melee. But he's already taken, what, a little over 100 losses? Let's keep this up. Oh, and I'm, I'm not watching my cavalry. So this part's actually going better than it did in, in the um, the demo game. All right. Supply surrendered. My unit just reloaded. They're reloaded. No, they're blocked. Okay, come over here. They're not reloaded, and they're prepared to fire. Bernie is still basically out of position, and we're ready to go to take all of these uh, supply wagons and then basically pull them all to a safe place back here. And more importantly, we don't want them giving out supply. We're going to have plenty of supply in this battle. It's a short fight, and you want all of their supply because that's just straight money right into your pocket when this battle's over. So you want to do that. You want to keep on going. And you also don't want to, yeah, see, perfect. So he's white shielded. This is when a unit is wavering and we actually saw the red route sign a second ago. So they're going to break and they're going to run away. All of this for we've, we've taken one casualty so far. Now their command comes in. We get two infantry volleys and uh, you know what? A third straight on their general. I want to knock Greg out ASAP. And let's make sure these guys don't shoot the supply wagons. Just walk into it and capture it for Christ's sake. Good God. All right. It's on, it's on slow mo because I'm watching everything really carefully. All right. Great. Excellent. Good job, dudes. Come on, let's knock out Greg. All right, there's another one. Where is it? There we go. Again, turn off the supply and just go hide it somewhere. And then uh, what we're going to do now is get Jones ready to run some stuff down and keep Davis from, from capturing this stuff. Poor Robinson's having a bad day. And there's their command. We have not taken out Greg, which is unfortunate, but fine. We need the howitzers on uh, where they can do the most work. So right now, that's going to be Joan, uh, John's, and the infantry as well on the cavalry, because these guys can cause untold headaches for me. And we want the Loren skirmishers faced at the right or correct direction. And then let's do that. All right. So 
So Poe is going to make contact, and that's fine. Third Infantry, the the two pound or the the twenty four howitzers are about to just tear him a new one. Sixth Infantry is in a great position to support, and I think it's better for first and second to just unload into Johns and really cause him some problems uh, than it is for. All right, once again, turn off the supply, uh, and we need to keep Davis from getting engaged. We could come and advance the infantry to defend our center, although we're not really at this point terribly concerned about the center. So Poe's having a terrible day. As is, oh man, this is this is what can happen, and now I need to ride down um, Johns. I think I didn't have enough skirmishers over here to like double convince the enemy not to engage. Yep. It's one of the really terrible things is that even even though they're routing, which is silly to me, even though they're routing, they route like through your units and they count as being in melee. Um, so I'm taking casualties here that I don't think I should be taking. It's just silly. Well, that's really frustrating. Um, this is actually pretty terrible, to be honest with you. Having fifteen hundred some odd cavalry and basically in my backfield, uh, I didn't. I don't think I filled up this space enough, and so now these guys are kind of running into my rear, while I'll also need to be dealing with the mass uh, arrival of reinforcements in this direction. So I'm not terribly concerned about the possibility or risk of these units getting broken uh, anymore. But now I'm um, running into the problem that. I'm going to have to deal with them in the back corner versus trying to pin them in the corner, which can work and did work in my test game, of course. So now I need to get the Tridegers way the fuck out of Dodge now. Yeah, I'm going to lose the unit. That's great. That's incredibly frustrating. So, of course, it went smooth as butter in my trial game, and uh, we're going to be doing this, this nonsense today. That is, uh, it is what it is. I'll manage. It's just a little silly.
So I merged uh, these units here because uh, Second Infantry lost its commanding officer somehow, and I'm sure I'm sure it happened during the initial engagements. I just didn't catch it. Um, First Hussar has done well for themselves, knocking out two units. Let's see if yeah we can get lucky with their artillery having been kind of exposed. Like there's no way that these units can like do anything at this juncture, but they're. Their mere presence requires being dealt with. Oh, man. I'm so peeved that I lost that cannon unit. Oh, my goodness. It's not, irreco it's not irrecoverable from. It's just really, really frustrating. It's just that one unit, right? Okay. Happy to engage Palmer like this. Two to one. Even though he's a melee unit and I'm not, I think we'll be fine here. So I'm deploying fourth here in a position to block Poe. He's still in cover, but it's not as... It's mildly less good than my cover. And hopefully Poe being kind of by himself will prevent him from really uh, getting the most out of it. And let's hope we can run down Palmer here. Uh, I'd love to get another unit surrendered or whatever. Uh, but whatever castle here is utilizing, looks like he's using pretty good melee weapons. We can capture those. So as much as I'm really, really, really peeved about that uh, cannon unit, um, I don't know. I think this will end up being mostly okay. How are you doing? You winning? Let's get Fiasco over there. Yeah, you're winning. You're good. I, was just, I didn't say stop. Just walk into combat. You outnumber them now like a, by a significant margin, and none of you guys could carry over to the next level and next mission anyway. Uh, what's really frustrating from the perspective of play here is that casualties are generally light across the board, but 
again, it cost me a unit. I'm very mad at myself for that, as you can tell. Um, come on. Let's see if we can't run that brigade down. I'd love to capture whatever rifles they've got. We've only got half an hour. We've won the mission. That's nice. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get all the money from these supply wagons too, which should be 5000 each. So that's fifteen grand right there, plus whatever the mission gives. Um, I mean, we're okay. Like I said, we're fine. We're going to capture some of those, re recover some of those guns anyway. It's annoying, not um, campaign breaking. And second artillery is getting um, a lot of good work in here. Hopefully they pick up, this guy picks up a commander, and or sorry, a uh, colonel, colonel C. And these guys pick up um, their star. I'd imagine they will. Poe is just having a terrible day. Fifth infantry should pick up a star, probably. I don't know what the hell Robinson was thinking. We'll get the Hussars in there and see if they can't wipe up Poe. It'll be nice or, or better, more reliable when there's um, two units working together. I wish I could put these guys on melee mode. All right, close it up. And I know that they're formed, but they were just routing a second ago, so they're probably at 50% melee. This should probably be an instant. Yeah, they're not even firing accurately. This is not going to be an instant route, but damn near to it. Great job. All right, ride them down. Don't give them a chance to breathe. Where's their cannon? They're, it's, it's pretty well protected. All right. In the 13 minutes we have left, we're going to see if we can't break with a wood line and um, seek a general engagement. Ah, great. We wiped up one of the cav units. Wonderful. Let's see if we can't get John's as well. I find it unlikely, but we'll see. We'll try our luck. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, melee cav especially, it's better to break the... Yeah, see? It's better to break the um, melee engagement because you'll still, as long as you're... As long as the unit spaces overlap, you'll still be in melee, but then you'll shoot your revolvers on occasion and just get a lot of kills really quickly. And that can be the, the difference between Poe continuing to run and Poe snapping and uh, surrendering sometimes. Yeah, here you go. All right. Come on, dude. Give up the ghost. You're falling apart here. Come on. You're out in the open. You're shattered. Surrender. Give me your guns. Um, whatever. It's still good kills. Still phenomenal melee experience. All right. That's unacceptable outcome as well. Not the ideal, but I'll take it. All right. Burnside. And there's the battle. Uh, wow. Okay, so with the exception of the artillery, it's actually less casualties than my test game. 361. Oh, that is even more frustrating. <laughs> oh, man. Man, oh, man, oh, man. That's terrible. Okay, well, we captured the things and we inflicted a lot more casualties on them than they did us. It's almost, almost 10 to 1, uh, isn't it? Right? No, not quite, but it's still really good. Um, a bunch of missing. Yeah. Ah, oh, God damn it. I'm so mad at myself. Promoted, promoted, dead. So, um, not good. We lost a light colonel of which we currently don't have a lot. Like later on in the campaign, I'm not going to care. Light colonels will be a diamond dozen, but right now that's kind of annoying. Um, what do we, what do we capture? So we recovered one Tredegar and captured in trade two 12 pound howitzers, which is a horrible trade. Horrible trade. Oh, God dang. We did, however, capture a whole boatload of um, melee cavalry revolver swords, which is a nice combo. Um, and then, like I said, about 15 grand. So uh, 
Yeah, I don't know if that was actually good. Um, but there you go. That's an ambush convoy. Gained a shitload of cash and a bunch of guys. Um, well, I suppose I know what guns we're going to use to fill out the unit, huh? Mm. God, that really pushes my shit in. Man, that's frustrating. All right. Uh, so if I lose a unit, I don't replace it in terms of numbers. Um, I just, you know, I add it to the rolls of lost units and I, I move on. So there will never be a first artillery because I out I positioned it poorly. However, second did pick up their star. Um, and so evidently when you're playing this, the logistics perk does not always work. Um, but neither of these are really terribly important for artillery. So I'm going to go, you know, it doesn't always work, but I'd prefer to have this for the turns when it does. We'll see. Uh, the efficiency boost is also nice. And we'll go ahead and replace the uh, cannon crew. Cannon crew uh, are typically the only units I replace with uh, sniper uh, veterans and also probably snipers. And we'll go ahead and bump you back up to fighting strength because the $500 is not that much and it maintains their stats because these units, they need to be kind of elite whereas the the lion infantry can really kind of afford to be really pretty much whatever. So we're going to go ahead and give second infantry a major uh, and that's because they can maintain their star with a major and I can turn Dwayne Le Pain here into a light colonel in no time. So uh, giving them a, a lower degreed officer is fine for the purposes of maintaining uh, the star. Let's go ahead and refill these two units up to their cap. Barely cost us anything in terms of resources or uh, experience and I just keep on bumping up to 1,000. So why did I pick 1,000? I like 1,000 as a starting, as a, as, a, as a size, predominantly because it tends not to throw scaling out of whack too terribly much. Now scaling, the way that the game determines how large enemy brigades should be is a function of two things. One, this number, and then two, the average size of your unit. And so what you can do if you want to spoof that scaling is you can create a whole shitload of 500 man brigades and then that will obviously yank down um, the mean or average of your uh, the size of your infantry brigade. It will do it to my knowledge by unit type. So the average size of your guns, the average size of your cavalry, the average size of your skirmishers. As far as I understand, that breaks down by unit type. It, it I think um, so. That that's a thing to consider as far as you know uh, where you are with that. Uh, so I like a thousand because it gives what I consider to be enough oomph to the unit in terms of its shooting to be effective and also its ability to take a couple of hits and keep fighting. Um, and then uh, later on, I'll grow to a cap of at the absolute most. I think I, the highest I ever feel comfortable with is 1,700. Um, and that's uh, predominantly a maneuverability thing. So over a certain size, and I guess Panda Kraut's uh, mod does re reduce the... Um, power of the diminishing returns but um, as units get larger they suffer diminishing returns for each added additional soldier and or uh, or cannon or sniper or whatever um, and so they move more sluggishly they fire less effectively they move slower they all that kind of stuff so I like 1500 to 1800 somewhere in there as like my dream size my ideal is like 16 and change um, oh you got a star too and let's take a look. I, I pretty much never take discipline training, ever. Um, stamina and accuracy or stamina and speed. Yep, let's do that. So you might see, depending on if you're using a modified version or not, here you might see mounted speed um, under horseback riding. Evidently, uh, the game does not actually differentiate between mounted speed and regular speed. So you could take this speed or this perk gain um, dismounted speed, but also gain mounted speed. So 
there's no reason ever to not take this perk in terms of the way that the files work underneath the core of the game. Um, and I'm still actually going to take this perk uh, because speed is so, so, so important for your ability to continue riding down fleeing foes. We captured a bunch of these Colt 55s, which is great. Um, and we picked up a bunch of stats too, which is wonderful. We'll bump up to our authorized cap of four. 450 and lose barely any stats in the process which is great as well costs us nearly nothing because we already have the guns and we already have the men um excelente and as far as the perk here again i basically never choose discipline training because i don't worry about morale it just doesn't matter as the unit gets more experience in the battlefield its morale naturally goes up i'll even happily take the minus one morale perk here from using reputation however uh, stamina is an incredibly vital stat, and I uh, value speed very highly because the ability, in my opinion, to move into uh, defensible terrain quickly and secure it and gain the initiative in terms of positioning is the most important thing you can do on the battlefield. And again, we'll use rookies and bump to a 1,000. All right, so this is the army that we're going to take into the next battle. Uh, let's bump you up. Oh God, I'm so so mad at myself for that. The three the three incher will do just as good as a as a Tredegar will in a pinch. Um, oh man, I'm so so pissed about that. Okay, well it is what it is. It, it happened. Move on. Um, here we go, and we'll go ahead and do our perk army org at five. While the five makes it so that your maximum. Um, brigade gets larger, right? Yeah, oh, the number of brigades you can have. So two, three, four, currently a cap of 12 brigades, 15 brigades, and then you can see here what you would gain at the next level. You can field two core, four divisions per core, and five brig divi brigades per division. So what the important point of Army Org 6 is, is you add our fourth division. And right now we can field three. And what that uh, fifth point did is now we can make these a little larger. And so what that means is that for the purposes of organization, I can now fill out first and second division going into um, uh, stay alert and benefit from the fact that both of the divisions there are commanded by Brigadier Generals in the case of Tom Jackson and Randy Greider. I don't believe I have any other generals at the moment and all of that stuff. So this is a bit of a long-winded video. I do apologize for that, but some of the camp stuff has not been discussed from a Confederate campaign perspective, and I have definitely been breezing through up to this point because, honestly, in the Union campaign at this level, I don't, at, at this point, we're at the point where I am in the Union campaign leading into Cold Mountain, or, yeah, Cold Mountain, I don't need to go into, oh, I have 1,500 men in the brigade or whatever. It's just, it's, it's you know... At that point, you followed along and you've kind of watched how it's all gone and, and so forth. Um, given our financial situation, it's likely I'll be able to arm everything going into Shiloh with at least the Mississippi. Um, I may use some of the Springfields because I have them, because I just I just have them. And I may theoretically even go so far as to make um, two very large brigades with all the Springfields I have and just have them be kind of like meat shield brigades. We'll see. Um, so we'll, that's a thought process. Anywho, uh, without further ado, the next video will be stay alert sometime later this week. And that is also a 10 brigade map. Um, where you get some of it and then you get some of it later. So you deploy with, I think five of your brigades and the remaining five trickle in from down here and you, you fight off, um, you defend a, a supply depot, um, somewhere near Corinth, Mississippi. Anywho, um, I hope this was insightful. I hope you guys learned a lot. And again, please do check out other perspectives on some of these issues because I don't want to be the only voice you hear and then you discover you hate it. Um, so my play style is, you know, I'm not good at micro and I don't, I don't like, I don't enjoy micro. Um, and so I don't do micro, uh, but maybe you do. So, so take a look and see what else is out there. Uh, Spectrum is, is one of the guys that I like in terms of what he does, where he makes use of these incredibly small elite brigades. And then he puts them in like a larger chaff brigade and they'll have, you know, they'll have 
you know, Fayetteville's or some shit. He'll, he'll put these tiny, tiny brigades with Fayetteville's and put them in these super brigades and he'll do all kinds of nifty stuff with them. So um, do check out some of the other guys that are out there, uh, even if they are doing a union campaign, because most of the tricks in the union campaign will more or less work in the Confederate campaign. Uh, with that being said, we are closing on almost an hour exactly. I hope you guys had a wonderful Thanksgiving and the rest of your holiday season or winter is going great. And if you're seeing this in the future, um, you know, whatever holiday is about to come up is, is also going wonderful. Um, and without further ado, this is Fiasco saying uh, good night and signing off. I'll see you guys in the next one.